to allow ourselves to kind of step into this conversation, I would love for you to use your imagination with me and imagine yourself in a familiar team meeting. Perhaps, perhaps as you're sitting around the conference table or you're sitting in the boardroom, wherever that moment may have been. Some of you don't have to imagine this very hard because you have sat in these environments many times. And so you're sitting around the conference table and it's in the middle of a contentious discussion. The opinions are varying. Uh, words are being thrown across the table. It, the stakes are extremely high. Oh, okay, take that back. This is not what meetings look like right now, is it? They maybe look more like this. So you're in a Zoom meeting and you're looking at the computer screen. This is more like it in 2021. So you're, you're sitting at the computer screen, but, but the opinions are still varied. And people, you may want to mute somebody because they're screaming at you too loud. And it seems as though consensus or teamwork is this elusive idea. And everybody passionately cares about the outcome, but no one seems willing to give. Like compromise just does, doesn't even seem within reach. And typically... There is a leader, not necessarily the leader, but a leader will speak up and just cut through the noise with a statement, something like this. Here's what we're going to do. And they just cut through all the noise with some direction. Now, now you may not have, maybe you've not sat in a Zoom meeting or a conference room like that. Maybe it's been uh, a family conference. Don't you love those? Or, or a classroom. And, and still, you're, you're, you're working with people, and everybody's got uh, a different agenda or a different of opinion. And we find comfort when someone speaks with authority and gives us, hey, this is the pathway forward. And all of a sudden, people in the group typically rally around that because we desperately desire leadership, clarity, and direction. Okay, let's pin back even further beyond just a classroom or a family meeting or a conference Zoom meeting. And let's just pan the landscape of our world. And when all around us in our current context, it seems like things are spiraling out of control and we're desperate for clarity. We're desperate for unity. We long for direction. We just wish that someone would speak with some anthem or a banner that we could carry. And if we're honest, most of us take in the panorama of what we see. And yes, even as believers, we step back and we begin to wonder, where is God in all of this? Why does he seem to be silent? What is it he's trying to say? Why is he allowing such tragedy and friction and division around us. And I'm not going to ask you to show your hands or send in something in the chat, although you're welcome to engage in that way if you'd like. But these questions are honest, they're raw, and they're even understandable. And Scripture gives us some comfort in those moments. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Hebrews chapter 1. Here is where we can find some comfort. It's in point number one. If you're taking notes in the worship guide or following along in the mobile app, you may want to write this statement down or fill in the blank. God has clearly spoken. God has clearly spoken. Let's read Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2. It says this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom also he created the world. Uh, many of us, truthfully, all of us are searching for truth. And we sometimes, some people assume that God is hiding that truth from them or hiding the answers to some big questions. But here is a matter of fact statement I would love for us to understand. God is not silent. Uh, let's be honest. E even for most believers uh, online or in the room, ha have you even, ha have you had that thought over the past year, year and a half of God, why why are you silent? Faith, by definition, 
is belief in the existence of God even when I can't see him. Faith, by definition, is trusting in the conversation from God even when I can't hear it. And here, let's, let's kind of dive into this text just for a minute to see what God may have us to learn that we can build off of. Uh, when did God speak? Well, uh, the, the language here that begins in verse 1, uh, long ago, it harkens to the opening line of Star Wars, does it not? Long ago in a galaxy far, far away. It, it's a phrase, long ago, that requires me to look back in the past I may have to go back a week, a month, 10 years, look back in order to better understand the present, even more so to gain some clarity for the future. And, and while this was written long before Star Wars was ever written, the writer of Hebrews is challenging the reader, you and I now, to look back and to reflect upon the faithfulness of God to consider how God communicated in the past. Primarily, he did so through the prophets. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But more importantly, how he chooses to communicate now through his son, Jesus. Long ago, at many times and in many ways. Now, is that redundant? It, on the surface, it may appear to be many, many there's an, a, a redundant use of adjectives, or you may have a translation that says uh, sundry times in various ways, or different times in differing ways. Either way, regardless of how the English is translated, uh, he's communicated at various times in a numerous ways. Can we get nerdy just for a minute? Can I have your permission? Okay, because we realize this, this book wasn't originally written in English. So here we've got some Greek words, and while translated here uh, in the English Standard Version, many and many, it's actually two different Greek words. One is polymeros, and the other is polytropos. And it's important that we understand the difference between those two words. The first many, polymeros, it means many parts. It implies God's revealing more and more over time as the day approaches. For example... When we read Genesis 1 and 2 and we see him in the Garden of Eden and we get to Genesis 3 and we see the fall of man, God interacts with Adam and Eve and he, he makes these clothes for them to cover their nakedness and he cracks the door, illuminating Christ, a very brief description of him that one day a redeemer would come. And all throughout Scripture, that door where that crack of light begins to open more and more and more. As he communicates and reveals himself through the prophets, more and more truth, many different ways, polymeros, that truth is communicated, all pointing to this great story of redemption, of reconciliation, of, of this rescue mission of humanity that God would send Jesus to the world. So, Polymeros, many times this truth has been more and more revealed over time. And in many ways, polytropos, meaning different me means and methods of delivery. And when we read through this story of polymeros over time, being truth more and more revealed, we see some examples of polymeros. Uh, we see him speaking through a still small voice. We see him revealing himself to the Israelites in a cloud of, or, uh, of fire. We, we see him using uh, a donkey sometime we, to, uh, as Balaam uh, is riding on his back. God literally spoke through an animal. Most oftentimes we see him using sometimes miracles or signs and wonders. But through the Old Testament, primarily he used the voice of prophets. It may be Elisha or Obadiah. It may be Isaiah who specifically spoke to the people of Israel. It may be Jonah who God spent as a prophet to give a specific message to the Gentiles. But all throughout the Old Testament, we see one prophet after another as God is using this polytropos means, ultimately communicating the same message. Restore relationship to God. Redemption, reconciliation, come back to God, be faithful to God. God wants to walk with you. God wants to speak with you. It was truthfully the same message over and over and over again that God used many means and methods to deliver. And here's what we need to understand. God 
can still use all those methods today. He primarily speaks to us through his written word and through the person of Christ. But I'll be, Dr. Sam is here. Good to see you, my friend, my brother. Uh, he can attest, and I have seen examples, when you get to India where they don't have the written word, there are a lot of acts types of encounters that are still happening there, there every day. I mean, God is, it's the same God, he's still capable of all those things. Here in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, Jesus. If I were to give you the entire sermon today in one simple sentence, here it is. God has spoken. We have only to listen. When we look around the world, it's not really a question of whether or not God has spoken. He has clearly spoken. It's really more of a question of, am I listening? Am I in a position to listen? And when we cover through the, poly, the, the, the many stories over the Old Testament, here's what we can see. The prophets spoke about God. Jesus spoke as God. And even all the way back to Exodus, in fact, I encourage you, you can read this later if you want. Read Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 through 21. There is a powerful story as God begins this journey with the people of Israel. And he's here on the mountain. He desires to speak directly to the people. And the people out of fear say, no, we will not hear from you. Moses, why don't you go talk to him? From the very beginning, God has been saying, I'm speaking. I want to speak directly to you if you will only listen. Wow. So here we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2, although, uh, uh, although he has spoken in these many ways in the past, he now speaks to us through his son. We no longer ever receive messages from a messenger. We're hearing the message straight from the horse's mouth, if you would. Wow, that's awesome. And here's what's truthful. When we look around our world today, we may be expecting some new and fresh word from God and think he is being silent when instead he is patiently waiting for us to listen to the things that he has already clearly spoken. Let me go back and say that one more time because that needs to press into our soul. There may be times when you and I are expecting some new and fresh word from the Lord and we think he's being silent, when in fact, rather than being silent, he is patiently waiting for you to listen to the things that he has already said. God doesn't utter words just to hear himself speak. When he speaks, he does not stutter. He speaks eloquently, and he speaks with purpose. He eloquently spoke the cosmos into existence. He eloquently spoke a message of reconciliation through the prophets in the Old Testament. And today, he eloquently speaks through the incarnation of Christ and the continuing work of Jesus himself. Why does he do that? Point number two. Because Jesus clarifies truth. We're searching for truth Jesus said himself in John 14, 6, I am truth. So as God speaks through Jesus, let's read verses 3 and 4 and see we sang of some of these adjectives just a moment ago in our time of music worship together. Now let's read of some of these descriptive adjectives of him in our worship through studying scripture. Verses 3 and 4. He, speaking of Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than there. There is so much depth revealed in these verses to the nature of Christ. Jesus is full of authority. He is full of power. He is preeminent. Jesus is cut from the same cloth. He is identical in nature and character to Father God. There may be uh, many modern phrases or words we may use to describe him, and truthfully, none, none of them seem adequate. The truth is Jesus, he literally 
upholds the world. I remember, uh, you know, do you remember the, the, this, this goes back to the old school days of the 80s, the picture of Tony Atlas, you know, of him holding the world on his hand, right? Like the world's strongest man. I remember the, the gym I went to, like that was the logo. It was this, this powerful man. And that was just an, an imagery to illustrate some human who seemed to have amazing strength. But that literally is a picture of Christ. He has the power to hold the world in his hand. That's more than just a children's song. He's got the whole world in his hands. He really does. He com his atoning act of death completed the system of sacrifice that we read of in the Old Testament. He came to fulfill the law, and now he has satisfied all of that law. And this gave him the right to continue as our priest, but now seated to symbolize that he has completed what no one else can do. In this position of power, in this position of authority. He, let's look at some adjectives here. He is the creator. He created the universe, all 100,000 million galaxies, each with 100,000 million stars, each 600 trillion miles across, and each fleeing in a never-ending expansion. That's an awesome God. He is our sustainer, holding things. He is sustaining at the same time the galloping galaxies across and at the same time sustaining the submicroscopic atoms that hold things together, all by the power of his spoken word. He is, he is the radiance. He, like the sun, he is, he is the source and the radiance of divine glory. He's not a reflection of Apart from the glory of God, he is God himself. He is a representative. He is the exact representation of the Father. He is everything God is, yet separate. He is with God as God, one with God. He is our purifier. His ultimate sacrifice paid the price for our sins so that we can be restored in relationship with God to purify us so that we can be made clean and whole and in union with God again. He is our ruler. He sits on the throne having paid the price for our sins once for all as our supreme priest. He is seated at the right hand of the majesty of God. And wonder of wonders while he's there. He intercedes on our behalf to the Father. Come on. That's an awesome God. It's as if, it's as if this game of hide and seek that we, we played as children, or sometimes uh, you may still play it with your children, uh, the fun of the game is not seeking. The fun of the game is the aha moment of being found. And God is speaking so that you who are lost can be found drawing you into relationship. God does not hide but desires to be found. He speaks so that we may know him more and be drawn more to him. And for some reason, some of us are waiting. God has clearly spoken. You have only to listen. W what bigger sign do you need than Jesus himself uh, you want a sign in creation, great. He's the heir of all things. It's, it's all his. And by the way, all things were created by him. So he's got creation covered. You, you want the glory of God to shine down on us like it did in Moses? Great. He is the radiance of the glory of God. And he is exactly God's thumbprint, his, his DNA, as it were. You want the power of God? Well, okay. Okay. He, he upholds the universe by his power, so check. You want forgiveness? Perfect. He is the one that made purification for sins possible, and he finished what no one else could do. You, you want an angelic visit from an angel like Mary and Joseph? Cool, I get it, I understand. But have you met Jesus? Jesus? He, he, he's way better than an angel. Jesus is better than all of that. 
And today we're embarking on a journey as we will go verse by verse, understanding that Jesus is better, navigating through the book of Hebrews. And together we're going to see that the creator of the universe has gone through great lengths to rescue me and you so that we can have relationship with him. And we're going to see and learn that he is bigger, better, greater, more powerful than even words in the human language can describe. We will learn to see that he is built upon the ancient foundations to complete what no one else could do. We will better understand that he has invited us into the grace that God has initiated to bring him glory. Now let's, let's circle back to where we started and let's put our minds back in that conference room, that classroom, that Zoom meeting, that family gathering, or maybe just even the frustration of the news cycle. And we see that's all around us and the frustration is growing and we just wish that someone with authority would speak and give us a path forward with clarity. It's already been done. We're waiting to hear a fresh word when we simply just need to listen to what's already been said. It, it, it's kind of like this. Uh, this was more so when my kids were smaller. Maybe I've got a long list of things that I need them to do, but, but knowing that they may not have the bandwidth to process it all of at one time, I may say, go take out the trash, and when you do that, come back and see me. Okay, and they come back. Okay, now I need you to go make your bed. Okay, now I need you to pick up your toys. And when they're little, we have to kind of break it down for them in such a digestible task that they can complete, because if we were to say, hey, I need you to do da, 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 they would be frozen in time. And we do that on purpose because we understand their immaturity and their age to avoid them being so overwhelmed that we want to deliver information in a pace and in a way that it can be digested. Now, I, I can't speak for God. I certainly don't have the authority to put words into his mouth. But I can only assume he's expecting us to listen to some simple things he's already given us, and rather than doing it, we're just standing there wanting them to give us something else. God has spoken. We have only to listen. I think sometimes, maybe we get a little overwhelmed. It's like this. I'll tell you the story, then I'll be done. So uh, those of you that were with us a, a few weeks back, and I told you the SeaWorld story, you'll remember that? And if you remember the picture that I showed you of my little cousin that was forced to take a picture with the penguin, if you weren't here that week, you can go back and listen to it or watch it online. It's one of the most horrific moments of my life, but another time, another day. Well, that little cousin, Timothy, who was, you know, crying, taking the picture, that dude would talk a mile a minute. I mean, he talked so much, you just tuned him out. Like you just, for, in fact, I remember on that same trip, he would be in the back, just da 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 You know this kid, right? You, you know this kid, nonstop. And we would say, all right, Timothy, I will give you $20 if you cannot speak for a minute. Amen. Amen. And so, okay. And you can look and you can see him start to bounce. And every time, like you're watching the clock, like 50, 55 seconds in, has it been a minute yet? He just couldn't, he never got the 20 bucks because he couldn't be quiet. His chatter, though, this is why I tell you that story, his chatter became so constant, you just tuned it out. Now, here's what I think many of us has done. God has spoken. He is speaking. He speaks to us every day. You can't walk outside and look into the clouds and not see the radiance of the glory of God, who through Christ holds everything together. And he's speaking so loudly. We sing songs that declare his truth. And, and we have Bible verses that are written on our walls and our homes. And, and we have our Bibles that we need to brush the dust off. And he's speaking, he's speaking, he's speaking. And we've tuned him out. What if we could slow down 
and position our heart to acknowledge, God, you're speaking. I really want to listen. That simply may mean slowing down enough when you're pulling the trash can in at night at sunset to slow down and stop and just take it in. Say, wow, God, you're beautiful. You're awesome. It, it may mean that when you're frustrated with your kids, in the frustration, you stop and you slow down and you say, wait a minute, God, thank you for the gift of life. This truly is a gift. It may mean that when, when I've just glanced over that Bible verse that I've sang, that I actually stop and read it and think about it. It may be that when I sing that song or it's playing on the radio, I actually pay attention and reflect on the words that are coming out of my mouth. He is speaking. He is speaking loudly, screaming it. And he desires for us to listen so that we can then cry from the mountaintops that he is our redeemer. He is our savior. He is our rescue. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He has all authority on heaven and earth. He is our savior, deliverer, redeemer, friend. He is better than anything ever. God is speaking. Are you listening? What's he saying to you today? What is he saying to you now? And what are you going to do about it? Will we walk in obedience? Will we rest in his glory? We will proclaim him to the nations with boldness and confidence. I need you to know who I just met. Okay, I'll tell you the story, then I'll be done. It's Super Bowl Sunday. If you just by chance had the opportunity to have had dinner with Tom Brady last night, do you think you'd be telling people about it today? You know you would. You'd be posting that selfie on Facebook. You'd be calling on, you will never guess who I had dinner with last night. Tom Brady, he's playing in the Super Bowl today, but he had dinner with me. You'd be calling all of your friends. You would let everybody know. You see where I'm going with this. The creator, sustainer, author, perfecter, deliverer of the world is speaking to you right now. What if we responded with that same level of joy and expectation? I got to call you. I got to text you. I got to come see you. I got to write you a letter. You will never believe what Jesus told me today about himself. I can't contain that joy. It's flowing over from my soul because Jesus is better. <laughs>